Good evening. I'm Kathleen McCartney, president of Smith College. Welcome to our virtual presidential colloquium series. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from two remarkable individuals, one of Smith College's most admired and accomplished graduates and my friend, Gloria Steinem, and the remarkably talented and prolific film, theater, and opera director, Julie Taymor. What brings them together tonight is their collaboration on the film, The Glorias, based on Gloria's 2015 memoir, My Life on the Road. Four actresses play Gloria from childhood through adulthood. Julianne Moore and Alicia Vikander play Gloria as an adult. Really, there is a fifth actress playing Gloria, and that is the real Gloria Steinem, who appears at the end of the film. Janelle Monet is outstanding as Dorothy Pittman Hughes, and Bette Midler steals every scene she is in as Bella Abzug. To set the stage for tonight's conversation, I'll provide some background about each of our guests, and then we'll get started. Gloria Steinem came to Smith College from Toledo, Ohio. After graduating in 1956, she went on to a career in journalism and quickly became a leading voice in the feminist movement. She campaigned for reproductive rights and the Equal Rights Amendment, helped establish the National Women's Political Caucus, and in 1972, co-founded Ms. Magazine. Gloria launched some of the most important women's groups of the past century including the Ms. Foundation for Women, Women's Action Alliance, Voters for Choice, and the Women's Media Center. She is the recipient of numerous awards in journalism and human rights. In 1993, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2013, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. And in 2019, she received the Freedom Award from the National Civil Rights Museum. For her writing, she has received the Penny Missouri Journalism Award, the Front Page and Clarion Awards, the National Magazine Award, the Lifetime Achievement in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Society of Writers Award from the United Nations. I'm proud to say that her papers and many other foundational papers of the women's movement acquired with her help are available to scholars and activists as part of the Sophia Smith collection. Julie Taymor is a native of Massachusetts and a graduate of Oberlin College. Following her graduation, she traveled to Japan and Indonesia on a Watson Fellowship to study theater and dance. That experience deeply informed her distinctive visual style. Julie is an artist across many genres, but is best known for her production of The Lion King, which opened on Broadway in 1997, received 11 Tony Award nominations and earned awards for best director and costume designer. It remains the highest grossing entertainment title of all time. Julie has been honored in multiple disciplines in 2000 and her 2002 film, Frida, starring Selma Hayek, garnered six Academy Award nominations and won two. Her theater credits include Broadway's and Butterfly and Juan Darian, A Carnival Mass, which earned five Tony Award nominations. She has directed the operas Oedipus Rec with Jesse Norman, as well as The Flying Dutchman and Salome. She is the recipient of the 1991 MacArthur Fellowship and was a 2015 inductee into the Hall of Fame for Lifetime Achievement in the American Theater. In addition, Taymor has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, two Obie Awards, and the first annual Dorothy B. Chandler Award in Theater. Before we begin, I want to make a few comments about the format of the program tonight. In just a few minutes, you'll get to see a very brief preview of the film to give you a sense of it. I'll then pose a series of questions to our guests. We'll speak for about 40 minutes, and we'll show a second film clip in that section, too. After that, we'll take questions from those of you who are participating via Zoom. Please submit your questions via the Q&A function and we will get to as many as we can. And now let's watch the first preview. You're Gloria Steinem. Gloria? Gloria. 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 I am. I want to write about the women's movement. What movement? <laughs> Jobs actually require a penis or a vagina. 
Well, all the magazine people said don't do a lesbian story in the first issue, so I feel like we need to do a lesbian story. Gloria Steinem should rot in hell. You can't associate yourself with those crazy women. I am one of those crazy women. Can we change the world? Yes, we yeah. can. How'd you get the name Mankiller? I earned it. You earned it. <laughs> we gotta stop sucking and begin to bite it. And we'll rise up. This is the year of women's liberation. Will rise up. If you avoid Things conflict, my darling, conflict will seek you out. The truth will set you free. But first, it will piss you off. Well, welcome, Julie and Gloria. Uh, let's begin our, I think we're ready to begin our conversation. We're ready. I think we're ready. ready? Okay, there we are. I think for a minute we were seeing Smith College instead of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's begin this conversation. And I have to tell you, I solicited the first question from Len Berkman, a professor of theater here at Smith. He notes, you share too many important perspectives and large scale ideas to be considered unlikely artistic collaborators, yet you have pursued very different artistic paths. What do each of you prize most in the other that differentiates you as individuals, but at the same time bonds you as artists and human beings? Who'd like to go first? <laughs> Probably neither one of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay, I get to go first. I'm older, I get to go first. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> uh, you know, when, when Julie called and said that she had read my road book and she wanted to make a movie out of it, I, there's no one else on earth to whom I just would have said yes about anything. <laughs> 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 because... I, you know, I mean, I keep saying this about her, which embarrasses her, but I think she's a genius. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's seen Across the Universe or Frida or, you know, any of her movies, and I thought, you know, no one on earth is going to be able to make a movie out of this book that covers seven decades and two continents here and in India. But I just had total faith <laughs> because, because I'd seen her movies. That was it. Right. Well, and so you know, you're asking, what is it about the other? It's it was a complicated yeah. question. So, do you want to restate it, Kathleen? Well, he says, what do you prize most in the other that okay. differentiates you but bonds you at the same time? I mm. think what what I, I would say, if there's any characteristic that I've learned from Gloria, is her ability to listen, and you know, being a director, it's sort of the antithesis in concept, isn't it? because a director is supposed to tell people what to do and be the leader and do all of those things. And learning from Gloria is really, I think it's just her, her absolute prize talent is her ability to um, see other people cross. This is where we're similar. We traveled a lot. She went to India right after Smith. I went to Indonesia right after Oberlin and Japan. And I spent three months made into four years. So I think there are alliances in our, in, our, in our lives that we share, which is this love of being in uncomfortable places. Right, Gloria, wouldn't you say that? Of, yes. of being able to cross gender, racial, cultural landscapes. So these are the things that we share. She has a very different way of directing. Than, than I do, and I find I find it very inspiring and moving, and I hope that, and I think it has come across in the film. And and the other thing is that Gloria really, you know, whether she loves this or not, she is a composite of all the women. I don't mean a composite like she doesn't have her own unique, but she has opened her arms and her um, ideas and her heart to the women who are around her. This is a love story. Our, our movie is a love story. And, and I would really like to just add that, you know, for most 
movies about women, there is always a relationship with a male, mostly, or a female, or, a, you know, I mean, it could be a sexual relationship with a woman. This one, though, Gloria's had a very diverse love life, I'm sure. <laughs> It was not where we wanted to go with it. She didn't go with it in her book. And I felt that the relationships with the Dorothy Pittman Hughes and Flo and Bella and Wilma and these women, this is the love story that I wanted to see. And she made me, you know, th thoroughly thrilled that we didn't need to have the, uh, what do you call it, the ubiquitous romance. It's, a, it's, a, it's something very fresh. It is a road picture. Um, it's, it's definitely a buddy film and with male films constantly, you, you have, you know, the women are in the background. It doesn't matter if Winston Churchill had a wife. It doesn't matter that Coretta Scott King was there in the house when the bomb went off. We don't know anything about those women. They are minor. It's the relationships between the males in all of these biographies. And I felt, you know, about time where we get to watch women work, women play, women love each other, women support each other. This is definitely not women against women in this mm -hmm. one. No, it is probably the first female road movie. I can't think of another, can you? Well, there's Thelma and Louise, but they die. They die at the end. At the end. Yes, right. <laughs> They're not allowed to have that kind of freedom. Right, right, right. <laughs> anyway, you can see why we work together because we finish each other's sentences. <laughs> exactly. Julie, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about, um, there are four actresses that play Gloria. Why did you decide to place these actresses in conversation with one another? And I think there's at least one scene where all four of them are in conversation. Tell us about that. There's more than one. There's a couple of them. Well, this, this movie covers the span of six years old, Gloria's life from six years old through 85, I think. And there's no way that one actress, let alone two, can cover her childhood. So once I committed to, I was going to have a young Gloria, and then I realized a six-year-old Gloria is miles away from a 12-year-old girl. This just doesn't even have to be Gloria. They're just not, you can't have one actress play a six-year-old and a 12. So the, the idea that there would be the Glorias, you know, that there would be more than one, and I didn't want to do a linear biopic because that's not what her book is. You know, it's a picaresque and it moves around, but it's not, it's not from 1940 to, you know, 2000 or whatever, uh, 2016. It's not that kind of um, linear story. Now, the thing that I loved about her book was the way that Gloria would comment upon things in her life and, and not just reminisce about them, but, but, but comment about what she wished she could have done or how she feels now or why didn't she do something. There are all these voices that kept coming from her, from her first person. So instead of having a voiceover, which is the normal thing that people do in biographies or movies, I decided, well, why not have the younger, the 20-year-old the Gloria speak with the 40-year-old Gloria, or the six speak with the 12. And that allowed for drama, you know? And I created uh, the most important thing that I needed to do to link all of these disparate experiences together was what I call the bus out of time. It's, I took what I would say is the overall picture of this road movie, road book, and isolated it to a single ideograph. And the ideograph or the image, the abstraction, is a Greyhound bus out of time, meaning it's not important what year it is. That meant that a six-year-old could be with the 70-year-old or all four of them could be riding the bus by themselves or with a shitload of very nasty 70 year old Gloria haters. You know what I mean? There was, there's all kinds of moments in that bus. They're on there when the father dies. They're not with each other. They're by themselves. But even the 12 year old crosses the aisle and holds the hand of the six year old. So it's much more of an inner journey. I was able to, to tell not just the exterior um, objective experience, but the bus becomes the subjective life, which in a book is through her own, um, what would you call that first person speaking? I don't know what you call it when you say, I wish I had told my mother back then that she should have gone to New York. I don't know what that's called in literary terms, Gloria. What would you call that when you make just, commentary? Just memory. <laughs> memory. Yeah, memory. Yeah. 
Yeah. And because a movie has to feel present, I can't, I don't want everything to be, mem I want it to, we're living there now. So the, the four Glorias on the bus, sometimes they're alone, sometimes they're together. Quite often, Alicia and Julianne sit next to each other and, and mock each other or, or uh, say, well, when you get older, that won't be a problem. I mean, I don't want to give stuff away. But they also are able to enter each other's scenes outside. There's a, there's a, there's a scene um, outside of, um, in Minneapolis, outside of Joan of Arc, is it Joan, St. Joan of Arc Church? Yes. Mm -hmm. And Gloria was invited to give the homily by Father Egan in a Catholic church. And as she arrived in the taxi, she described it, there were hundreds of protesters, anti-abortion, like right to lifers of the time, with the most gruesome images, as they would have, screaming that she was a baby killer. Now, what I decided to do, and this sort of gives you an example, the six-year-old is in that taxi, the six-year-old. Because when we look at Gloria and we see the glasses and we see the beautiful streaked hair and we see the poised Smith College graduate and we see all these lovely um, things about her, what we don't see is what's going on inside, what's in her, what's in her heart, where, where she's, she's, she hides it, as many women have to. They have to hide their emotions. If you've seen that, that Hillary uh, documentary, it's pretty spectacular to see how, what she had to do and why people then feel that she might be cold or might be inaccessible. Just, that's a phenomenal documentary on Hillary Clinton. So what I did was I had this six-year-old girl in the taxi, we're in the taxi with her, as these nasty, you know, screaming crowd is around her, but when the police open the door of the taxi and let her out, it's Julianne Moore. So what you have seen is what the fear, and should I be here? You know, all the things that, that we know Gloria was feeling or I would have imagined. As a filmmaker, I'm allowed to go into the inner landscape and expose it in an exterior way. That's my job. That's what I did with Frida when I did the paintings coming alive. It goes from an objective um, experience of history and events to a subjective telling of her life through her paintings. Uh, so the bus out of time and the ability to use the four glories, and we shouldn't talk about the fifth Gloria because that shouldn't be talked about. You, you, you don't, that's a spoiler alert, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> but um, those four glories uh, really are the composite of the full woman. But, but that's what I mean about when I was saying that Julie does emotional truths. That's what's so amazing. And later on, we discovered <clears throat> that I had written about multiple selves in a passage and yet in another book, a completely different book, Revolution from Within, uh, that you, Julie, had not read. I had not read it. No, no. that was saying exactly the same thing. That you, uh, you told me that. You said, oh my God, I, I often would see myself on a street corner, my younger self, and feel sympathy or feel like, well, now if you knew what I know now, would I have done that? <laughs> and so I, I think, you know, that's what we, that's the fun part of being in our profession as an artist. There are things that are not, you can't control, you know? There are connections that you, you just happen where you're on the same wavelength or you've experienced similar things. And I think Gloria and I found that as we delved into how does one make this movie? And she was um, so open to having her life displayed out there for everybody. Well, I thought that it was very innovative. I've never seen anything quite like it to have these versions of the same character in, in dialogue. So it's, it's fun for me to hear you talk about it. Um, Gloria, I have a question for you. Uh, you began your career as a print journalist and later an editor and author. And you have said, writing is the only thing that when I do it, I don't feel I should be doing something else. So um, this film is about visual storytelling and its role in movement building. And I'm just wondering how you feel about the medium. Well, I do think, um, I mean, I do love writing, obviously, and it is portable and you can do it anywhere and it has all kinds of virtues. Uh, but it is, uh, by its very form, a piece of writing or a book is something that happened in the past. Uh, a play, is something, it may be a historical play 
or even about 200 years from now, but because it's happening in front of you on stage, it has a feeling of being in the present. But what is so special and unique about movies is that they are timeless, they are dreams. And therefore, they can speak to us uh, emotionally, intellectually, narrative, leap back and forth. You know, it is a very, very uh, amazing art form on which I've always been hooked. I mean, ever since I was six years old and escaping into a movie theater, <laughs> you know. With your dad, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, it's just, it, it, it's really un, unlike, unlike any other art form in the sense of being timeless and universal. So I was one of those teenagers who bought the first issue of Ms. Magazine. I think I've told you that, Gloria. And um, I was thrilled to see the scene about planning that groundbreaking debut issue. So we're gonna show a clip of that and then ask you to talk about it. Lori, it would, it would just be nice to ha listen to you talk through that moment. I mean, the advertising director is worried about losing sales if you do some of these controversial issues. So what was going through everyone's mind during that decisive moment as you were deciding on the content for the first issue? Well, I, I think that really we were wanting to create a magazine we wanted to read. And remember that women's magazines still, but much more then, were really about buying things. I mean, because they were really doing articles that supported the ads. Uh, and, and in a way it's gotten progressively because even then there were uh, short stories in fiction, which are kind of gone now. So we, we just wanted a magazine that would come into each woman's house or office or wherever uh, once a month like a friend with, uh, you know, voices, all different kinds of voices, since we learn from difference, not sameness, uh, and just everything that we'd always wanted in a women's magazine and not seen. So you can imagine that we were constantly <laughs> saying, no, we should do this, do that, and so, uh, and it was fun. You know, there's nothing in life, in my life, more fun than an editorial meeting, because everybody everybody can talk, everybody learns, everybody listens. You come up with something that individually you never could have imagined. Uh, and it's the most collaborative fun possible. Well, it looked like it in the movie. Um, Julie, I have another question for you about an uh, artistic decision that you made. At several points in the film, you pivot to, I guess, surreal satire is probably the best phrase. The talk show sequence comes to mind especially. Um, tell us why you decided to use this device to tell Gloria's story. Uh, let me just think a second. The, the talk show is the only one that's satire. I wouldn't say that that's what I'm doing at all through the rest of them. They're, they're flights of fancy, I would call them. They go into surreality, but not satirical. The, the talk show host is a moment where the younger Gloria, about, you know, probably late 30s, early 40s, is Alicia Vikander, is asked about how she dresses and does, is she bothered by being thought of as a sex object? And the uh, interviewer, is, he says, I hope you don't, I hope you'll forgive me, but you're an absolutely stunning sex object, which comes from a real documentary that I saw that these, these, uh, dialogues, these lines weren't made up by me. Now that Alicia Vikander age, Gloria, she's wearing her, her, ubiqu you know, her whatever you've got under that red thing, her black t-shirt, her black pants, her black boots. It's not like she's wearing provocative clothing. <laughs> right there it is, the same black uniform. She's right. just, but she is so dumbfounded at this, this um, journalist asking this, that she just looks at him. And this is one of these places where then the older Gloria, the Julianne Moore Gloria, sits right down in that seat. They just, they just are, because of cinema, I can just replace them for each other. And she goes into this um, moment where she, first she says, you know, what I'm wearing is very comfortable as opposed to that tie that pinches your neck and those cuffs that you're doing. But 
What I wanted to play with was the times when women are, are things misogynist or sexist or various th things are said to them and the smile stays on their face. And behind that smile, there are all kinds of things that are being thought. And I wanted to show what was going on behind and what was going on behind in my imagination, this is not something that Gloria <laughs> necessarily told me, is the, the, the look that um, Gloria gives that journalist is such that he would probably just say, what a bitch. So I wanted to play with the bitch witch phenomenon. And I had the whole room turn red and I played with the idea of witches from the Wizard of Oz, from Macbeth, um, this thing of the little, so all four Glorias appear in what would be called a uniform, sexuality. So you have the, you know, Gloria was uh, an undercover bunny in Playboy magazine. So she comes on in this, the younger, the 30 year old Gloria comes on in her bunny costume and says, well, perhaps you prefer this uniform. And at first she's in, not a, he, not a um, burqa, but she's in what I would call kind of the uh, handmaiden's tale, nun, what do you call it? The habit. Or mm -hmm. perhaps you enjoy this because there's fantasies, male fantasies of women, whether it's a uniform of a, of a stewardess or a little girl in a schoolgirl's costume, like a schoolgirl's uh, dress with the short dresses, like in Japan, the amount of, of pornography of schoolgirls is astounding. So I let the four Glorias come in, the four different ages with their, um, their dress that could be called a uniform. And I play with this idea and then it ends up becoming, this is the hardest thing to describe, you just have to see it, but it becomes that image of the little girl on the broomstick and the other women are around this poor journalist who swept up into a tornado, but it's, it's not meant to be nasty or angry, it's whimsical. It's meant to be fun. And when you get to the end of it, you realize that didn't really happen. That was just a two second thought. And she says, could we read in the studio, could we rewind that please? And he asked the question again, I hope you're not mad. So it's yeah. whimsical. It's, uh, it, it, that would be the, the biggest word is the sense of humor that I think Gloria has. But I think all women in positions of leadership or power have this moment where they just don't, they absolutely cannot say, the answer to the question, or what they're thinking. It's whimsical, but it's also political because, political. because uh, one kind of culture causes women to reveal their bodies, whether we want to or not. And another kind of patriarchy causes us to conceal our bodies, whether we want to or not. But in both cases, we're not in control of our physical selves. So the this is for both of you. The, the film is being released on Prime Video at the end of the month, in the middle of a global pandemic, <clears throat> a time of heightened fear, lack of national leadership, deep racial and political divides. What, what is your hope for the film and what it might bring to audiences and uh, the difference it could make? Because um, we are all watching Netflix and Prime Video, so mm -hmm. I think you're gonna have a big audience, but what are your hopes for the film? Well, you want to direct that to one of them? <laughs> yeah. Either, I, for both of you. <clears throat> okay, I'll start because Gloria then can elaborate further. <laughs> we were hoping that we would be on a bus traveling through swing states right now. Gloria, myself, the actors, and any other women who wanted to join us showing the film and talking, having large talking circles through the swing states. So we were obviously... We, we, when we showed this at Sundance, a thousand people were in the audience and there was cheering and stamping and clapping and standing ovations. So that ain't gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Right. And we have wonderful distributors who are film distributors and they're very, we're very unhappy that we decided we wouldn't wait to put it into movie theaters. Because first of all, who knows when movie theaters are going to be open again. We felt it was much more important to get this movie out to as many people as possible, men and women, young and old, cross the lines. And I think that's what Amazon 
and, and streaming allows us to do with this film. We said, let's get it out a month before the election. Let's get it out before people are finished registering. And if we can at all be inspirational in saying to people, you, you know, she has a beautiful line, uh, you know, that she says, she said at the um, a women's march in Washington four years ago, it's not enough to press send. And I think that's an, ex she's got lots of fantastic lines, but that one I feel is very important because people have to get out there. And even with COVID, whether it's phones or whether it's talking to their parents or their neighbors or whatever it is, we can't be uh, complacent about this election. It's just way too scary. So I think if the movie can be a good time, but also inspirational, that it ain't gonna change. It's not going to change unless you're out there making that change. Mm. No, I agree. I regret that we can't be on the Greyhound bus <clears throat> getting the vote out in that way. But I hope that the movie serves to affirm our own stories, our own will, what we care about, and that it activates the vote. And I think that individual groups may well use it in that way so that they can, <clears throat> sorry, so that they can, um, you know, after a screening, they can uh, get their group together and raise money or use it in some way uh, to, to get out the vote. That it will, I mean, we, we spend an awful lot of time looking at screens and seeing what I think of as the virus in the White House, okay? Yeah. So we need to have the affirmation <laughs> of seeing our stories. And I feel uh, good about telling my story or Julie telling my story because I think it's done in a way that invites each viewer to tell her story and af affirm her story in all of its diversity and get it out there, including in the voting booth. Right. I mean, you know, the voting booth is, is the only place on earth or one of the few places where we're all equal. And, and uh, we, you know, in a way we don't exist unless we vote. So I hope that this storytelling and this affirmation of diverse existence will help to support in all kinds of different ways. We, you know, I'll be, we're kind of fascinated, Julie and I, to see what people do with this movie, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, to, to really uh, take our voices back and take our country back. Gloria, there's a, a moment in the film that uh, just struck me as a viewer mm -hmm. as being so poignant. And it's the scene where you're on the Larry King show and there's a, woman caller who is um, very aggressive, very critical of you. And the way Julian Moore portrays it is she's mostly silent, but she communicates uh, the hurt, I think, so effectively. And I was wondering if you could talk about that scene in real life and if it was upsetting to you, and um, if so, why? Mm -hmm. Well, it, yes, it was a real scene, and she was essentially condemning me for uh, destroying the family or her life or being a, 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 a negative force, you know? And, and I did feel uh, awful, you know, because the point is that I wanted to affirm her choice. So if that is her choice, uh, you know, then, uh, then that seems to me to be the point and she wasn't seeing it that way. I think because she felt that unless everybody else made the same traditional choice of home and family and children and so on that she did, that then they were saying it wasn't a good choice. Mm. That's not the point. <laughs> yeah. We're not criticizing each other's choices. We're trying to empower each other to make those choices. Right. Okay, well, I, I think I'm gonna ask a few questions that are coming in uh, via the, Q&A, and um, Julie, I think you'll like this one. Um, I'm gonna quote, I'm a Smith College alum from 97 and now a professor of English at Oberland. Oh. The Julie Taymor Fund has enabled me to take several groups of extraordinary students to study Shakespeare in Italy. So first, thank you. Mm -hmm. And my question, what do you most hope that someone like me will help convey to young women I take on trips like this? to this generation of feminists, social justice activists, and literature lovers? Well, 
that's wonderful that you do uh, take take these. Uh, it's not just women, I'm assuming, but take students to Italy to 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 what to study Shakespeare to that's what exactly. What yeah, that's what she says to study Shakespeare in Italy. But I think she wants to know about this fund you set up and Okay, my my um fellowship, I have a fellowship, the uh World Theater Fellowship, Julie Taymor World Theater or Taymor World Theater Fellowship. It's on hold right now because it's a traveling fellowship. Right. So what I what I am trying to do is my my Watson Fellowship upon graduating from Oberlin was absolutely critical to my journey as an artist. It's actually, I, I think it's where I really, even though I've been doing theater since I was eight years old, it, it, my time in Asia, like Gloria's, was the most important time of my life, creative time of my life. So I feel that Americans have these blinders on that were a little bit too myopic, that we don't really, because we think we're protected, of course, now we have, you know, the war is a cyber war, but people, directors, what I've seen in theater in New York and around, it's very in, in, inter, it's, it's just too much about America and Americans. And we really need to see what the world has to offer. So the people who get my fellowship, they go to Asia, Africa, Latin America, not Europe, because for so long we've been getting European writers, European playwrights, European theater, and what I want young directors to be able to enjoy and experience is the kind of experience I had where they see the extraordinary traditions outside of Western culture. So it's a year, it's a fellowship for a year, and right now it's on hold, but we've had the you know incredible uh, young, young directors. It's mostly for director choreographers, because uh, that's, they, they end up doing it all, you know, writing, directing, designing. So that's the fellowship. You can look it up online and you'll see some great stories from, from the various uh, fellows. So I, I hear you both. That's, so great. That's I just want to thank you for doing that because uh, when I went to India right after I graduated from Smith, I had to, I, I sat in an airline office for like six weeks until they finally gave me a free ticket <laughs> in order to get rid of me. <laughs> so, <right. laughs> So it's so great that you are enabling uh, people to go and to go to places other than Europe, other than Western. That's oh, wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. So you've both talked about travel being um, so powerful uh, in your lives. What other kinds of advice do you have for students who are interested in the careers that each of you has pursued? What, mm. what advice do you have for young people? Uh, well, I, when you say that to me, the first thing that comes to mind is, I, I know that this is maybe not too easy, but I still think it's the most important thing. Do what you love. Mm -hmm. Do what you love so much that you forget what time it is when you're doing it. That you would do it whether you get paid or not, though I so want you to get paid. <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, because I think that's how we discover what we were meant to do, what, uh, what is inside us that it, we have uniquely to contribute and that will be uniquely satisfying to us. Yeah, and, well, for me, it's, I've never really done anything. I've been very lucky to have a success with The Lion King, but frankly, that's it and it's enough. But I've never done anything I didn't love. So what Gloria is saying was that I wasn't impassioned about. I have to, I ha I'm not going to do it for fame or for money or for any other reason. As an artist, you just, you, you really do have to be impassioned about the work because it's going to take all of you. It really is all, I've been on the Glorious for five years. A critic can write it off in, in five seconds, you know? But it won't matter to me because the, it's the whole journey. It's not the accolades at the end. It's not the money at the end. It's the whole journey. And you have to, one thing that's very important is you have to really know your collaborators. When you work on something, make sure you're all on the same page. Because I've had some rocky times where that, that hasn't worked. And, you know, it's, it's, even though a director is a director, you're only as good, if you're a carpenter, you're only as good as your tools. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a group 
situation. So I think uh, in, in the jobs that you do, really important about collaboration. If you're at an age where you're just graduating from school, you're at that point, don't make any decisions yet. I think that COVID and what's going on now is going to make people really much more attentive to the quality of the experience. You know, of you don't need to have an apartment or a car or do, you don't need any of that. It's really about experiencing life and especially nature. I think we've got a big, absolutely apocalyptic tragedy happening with the environment. And hopefully people will wake up to that and will be, you know, besides all the human issues of choice and everything else, we really have to get a hold of this and appreciate the natural environment. You know, uh, today I was talking to somebody, Gloria, I just had a revelation. It's not a revelation, it's stupid. I'm sure you've thought of it. But I really think that one of the reasons that the environment is so poorly taken care of by our leaders, or not all of our leaders, but many, is because it's called Mother Earth. <laughs> I think if it was called Father Earth, there'd be a little less, you know, disrespect, let's put it that way. I think there is something that feels soft for people when they hear, oh, Mother Earth, we're hurting Mother Earth, it's hippie, it's whatever. But that mother is out there, and if she's enraged, she's got more power than anything else. And mm. I, think, I think we owe it to the animals, and I mean, just on this kick right now, where I really feel like that's what we should be hearing loud, birds dropping in New Mexico out of the sky, come on, you know, orcas surrounding ships. There is a, there is a call of the wild, Mm. And it's not just that whatever insects or bats or whatever gave us COVID, it's us who gave us COVID because we have gone into their, mm. private, their own worlds. And I would love, I would love more art and more um, consciousness and more creativity about this crossover between our earth and, and the humans who are um, taking it for granted. No, I think uh, it makes me think about Wilma Mankiller, the yes, chief that's right. Cherokee yeah. nation, who is, of course, in the film in a wonderful way. I'm so grateful that she's there. And uh, she used to say that if we are too uh, destructive to the earth, the earth, which is a living being, mm -hmm. will shrug us off and start over. Mm -hmm. that's and right. part of me wonders <laughs> if if COVID is shrugging us off in order to start over. I find that thought both uh, frightening and comforting because yeah. it is frightening in the sense that we'll be gone, but comforting in the fact, in the idea that it will continue. Gloria, um, here's a question from an alum. She writes, you spoke at my graduation from Smith in 1970. So you were the commencement speaker that year. And she said, you were my hero then and you're still my hero today. Do you think we've made any difference? So she, <laughs> of course we have, but she wants to hear uh, what difference you think we've made. Right. Sure. Well, it's very kind of her because I learned only after uh, some parents protested that my graduation speech <laughs> was was not what a graduation speech was supposed to be. I've forgotten what it was, but anyway, <laughs> so I'm glad to hear from her. She uh, liked it and remembers <laughs> it. No, yes, yes, no, we've, we've made a huge difference. If you consider uh, where we started out, you know, uh, when just not following a very traditional life pattern was viewed as very strange indeed. Uh, when in my class at, at Smith College, there was not one student of color, not one. Even though there were young women who had been at the Smith Tea, you know, in, in Washington, who had wanted to come. And when I asked the then Dean of Admissions, uh, he said, well, we have to be careful about admitting Negro girls was the phrase of the era, uh, because there are not enough educated Negro men to go around. Now, I, I, I mean, I just say this not to be critical retroactively, but just to say that there was a sort of uh, 
at least central consciousness. I mean, there were other things going on too, but there was that kind of overall consciousness at the time. And that has changed profoundly, profoundly. Women are way more likely, first of all, to, to look more like the country uh, and also to be able to and to want to find their own identity rather than finding a uh, identity by what they are attached to. It's, it's, it's really hugely different. Is it enough? No, it's definitely not enough. And there's also about a third of the country in rebellion against what I just described, mm -hmm. even though it now is a majority view. And just because it's a third doesn't mean it might not win, as we saw in the last election, even though it was, you know, because of the, you know, the electoral college, which we have to get rid of. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, the, it wasn't the popular vote that did it. So I think we, we've come a very long way. And perhaps one thing we haven't learned well enough is that after victory comes a backlash. Mm -hmm. I think we relaxed a bit because we had changed the majority and because we could see all kinds of change. And we forgot that the time right after a victory is uh, often the most dangerous. And I think that's what we're going through now. Mm -hmm. So, Gloria, this is a question from a friend of both of ours, and that is Mona Sinha. She wants um, to ask Julie, do you use the mother image through Durga and other images in the film? How do you imagine Gloria in that role? <laughs> what, as Kali, as Durga? Is that what she's... That's what she's asking. The mother image through Durga and other images in the film. Well, she comes from India, so I think. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean that that image of of the goddess was the first news magazine cover, so it wasn't my choice. It was it was a, a phenomenal cover, and probably Gloria knows more why that cover was chosen. But it is the well, goddess. It was Krishna, actually. It was no. all. I mean, I mean, it, it started out, and then we made Krishna into a woman, and so it. Yeah. Well, it is the blue goddess Kali yeah. with all the arms. Right. Um, it's it's not exactly Kali. I mean, this is the thing. Of, of course, it, it is. And then it's also there's a, a Mexican goddess with all those arms as well, who is the Durga character of Me Mexico or one in South America. That idea of all of these arms holding frying pans and clocks and driving and typing and it's. It was there for Ms. to show all of the different jobs that a woman has to do at the same time as she has a baby in the oven in her belly. So, you know, she's wearing a Western dress and high heels. And, but yes, it's not, it's not an exact Kali image. I don't think that there are any others like that in the movie, though. I'm not, I'm not, not knowing what, what she's referring to. Okay. Yeah, I think we were we were using it as the the many roles of women, and there was a right. tear coming down her cheek, not the all powerful image that it originally was. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, Gloria, here's another question for you from the audience. Speaking of women's magazines, can you explain your unlikely kinship with Helen Gurley Brown? There couldn't have been two more clashing magazines as Cosmo and Ms. On what level did you relate to Brown? And, and would you consider her an inadvertent feminist? <laughs> well, we, we didn't really relate to each other um, exactly. I mean, she was always very kind hearted, you know, but uh, I remember her getting in touch with me the first time because there were a whole lot of women demonstrating against Cosmopolitan in the lobby. And she called me up and said, uh, in a panic, you know, your people are demonstrating <laughs> against Cosmopolitan. I said, what do you mean my people? Women, she said, women are demonstrating against <laughs> and And they were, they were demonstrating because the, the formula of Cosmopolitan was uh, a, a bit of an advance in the sense that women didn't have to be married to have sex. That was the big breakthrough 
of Cosmopolitan, but it was still a hundred percent about gaining approval through your looks and sex and men and so on. And that's what they were demonstrating against. <laughs> so, so, you know, we were, we were in, in two different places, but, but she, she was always kind of kind hearted and helpful to us. Uh, and uh, we had a, a whole list of women saying, you know, I have had an abortion and I, you know, cannot be against the law and so on. And she contributed to that. She talked about having, it. so she, she was a transitional figure, I would say. Okay. Um, Julie, this is for you. Um, Sarah Rule is a playwright. And um, how did she come to be a part of this? And what sensibility did she bring to the script for The Glorious? Well, um, the, the kind of concept of the bus and The Glorious was something that I had already set up and had established of what, how the structure would be. So I went to Sarah really for some of the dialogue scenes, for some of the scenes between the mother, the father, the family, um, not, not actually any of the bus sequences or the surreal scenes or any of that, but she was very good at giving, you know, the more historical scenes. And she, she was able to cull from all the documentaries that she had seen and we had seen of Gloria you know, you've got the HBO and many of those and put it into uh, um, a screenplay that we then were collaborating on together. Okay. Um, another viewer wants to know, what are, what are some of your favorite scenes in the, in the film for both of you? Just moments that you take with you? <laughs> well, I, I love Julie's invention of the bus because it allows different scenes to be seen outside the bus window, different times, different eras. It allows people inside the bus, different ages of me, but also many different characters to, to relate to each other. I, I mean, as I was saying, I had no idea how she was ever going to make this, <laughs> this book that covered so much time and two countries and so on. And, and, and the, the invention of that bus is, is a genius thing to me that is pure Julie. And also it is available to everyone. It's not forbidding. You know, it's not, it's not economically restrictive in some way. It is a Greyhound bus, you know, we can all, <laughs> we can all imagine ourselves. Right, right. So I just thought it was such a genius invention. It was absolutely not in the book. She invented it. Yeah, I don't even think you traveled on a Greyhound bus in your book. <laughs> yeah, no, I was mostly on a plane or in a car. <laughs> but we had those too. We've got planes. We've got every kind of uh, <laughs> trains in India. Which the taxi driver? Yeah, the taxi driver. Oh my yeah, god, that's right. when she loads, right? That's I had to have the scene where Gloria finally. <laughs> <laughs> just uses a four letter word and explodes. But um, I, I don't, I can't say that I have a favorite. It's, but I must say every time we go to India and we're in the train with the women, mm -hmm. and they were such incredible women. I don't think they were actresses either. I mean, you know, you, you, we went there, we went for three weeks to India, but we only had three days or four days to shoot. I, I guess, cause I went through that like she did when I traveled on third class trains in Java. Um, just these women and and this young Gloria, I really enjoy those scenes. You know, I I think as far as being moved, it's the mother and the and the scene where the two Glorias, Julianne and Alicia, are talking about what happened to their mother. I mean, I just I'm constantly moved by it, and it's a direct lift off of what was in the book. Mm. Um, then there are visual things that I love. I love the Fred Astaire fantasy sequence. Yeah. You know, I'm very <laughs> proud of the visual effects because they're really, they're really, I work with great teams and they're really beautiful to look at. Mm -hmm. And no one's made them quite like that. I mean, I don't actually make those as a director. I give research and I had a great production designer and a great DP. And then with these various companies all over the place, we, we, we have a back and forth on creating the imagery. The Kali that you saw, that animated moment. People would take that magazine cover for granted if we didn't you know, show how it became uh, 
it starts out, which you didn't see, as a little gift, a little statue of Kali that was given to her by one of the editors of her, her compatriots, her collaborators, who gave it to her in, in the beginning of figuring out how they were going to make a magazine. And in our version, I'm not sure this was ever said, but uh, Gloria says, well, she'll guard against the demons that are definitely going to descend upon us. So you, you plant the little sculpture of the real Kali, but then you see how one thing can lead to another. So I love mixing style. You know, to me, a movie is not just about sticking a camera on a real situation. We have documentary footage, which I adore, and it's crappy. I mean, seriously, the Women's March, 19, Women's Not March, the Women's um, Conference in Houston, 1977, is the worst video stuff. <laughs> and we, re, we restaged some of it, but I didn't use everything we restaged. First of all, we couldn't get 20,000 people extras. But secondly, the reality of the real March on Washington in 1963 or the real women's conference where you saw the three first ladies and one, right? We see the real people. We see the real Phyllis Schlafly. Forget mm. it. I don't want to see a fake Phyllis Schlafly. I felt like, you know, in this film, it was a big choice not to have an actor play Phyllis because if you see the real one, you kind of go, holy shit. I mean, you know, you can't say, oh, well, she's just acting. You say, <laughs> wow just like the real Nixon or the real Harry Reasoner. So the combination, I'm very excited about the combination of documentary footage next to dramatic footage, next to surreality. So it's that, those are the moments when it goes back and forth that I, I, I enjoy. And, and one of the, the most mysterious things to me was that scene in the third class railway car in India because that was actually not in the book in that way, exactly. And, uh, and somehow it was exactly the way it was. I don't know. It happened to me. Yeah. Right, right, right. I was in that, in Java, and they said, are you married? Why aren't you married? Do you have children? You mm -hmm. know, what are those little hairs on your arm? Are they feathers? <laughs> and it was, I was there four years, and, you know, I was always a foreigner, always a foreigner. But... The women, you know, were very generous, and but it was always, why aren't you married? Which is something that Gloria has gotten. <laughs> and also you learned in those, in those women-only third-class railway right. cars, you learned. Yeah, yeah. When they're talking, you just, you learned, right. Oh, it, it's a, it was a great, exciting moment to shoot. So that's partly why I like it as well. I absolutely adored shooting in India and being with those women. We're almost out of time. Is there something you want to tell us about the film that I haven't asked? What, what do you want us to know about this film? <laughs> Julie, do you want Or you can ask well, me okay, I'll, say something. Or... I say, I'll say something. I think your 10-year-old girl should see it because um, we have a very weird thing called the MPAA, and maybe I'll get killed for this, but you know, we can have the most extreme violence out there in the streets and children see all kinds of stuff. And we got, a, I think we get an R rating because Flo Kennedy, who we're not going to censor, may say the word fuck two or three times. And then there's a, a, a picture of a drawing from Screw Magazine, but it's actually the real thing. That's it. There's no sex. There's no nudity. There's none of that on our film. And we should have gotten a PG-13 or PG. So what I want to say to you is when you see that up there on the TV screen, forget it. I've had 10-year-old girls see this movie and they love it, as well as having a six-year-old and a 12-year-old in the movie. It's very important that your little boys and your little girls, and not just the little girls, this is, I, I think the men in my life and the men that I know who've seen it have liked it equally to women and sometimes more. And I think one of the, I'm trying to reflect on that, but I think it's partly because it gives you an, a, a window into women working with women. How often do men, they don't. They don't get to see that. So they're very moved. The men, the men that I know who've seen it, they're very moved by the experience. So those two things are important. I think 10, I don't know, younger than 10, but around that age, this, whether we make a dent on this scary election or not, this is a history movie. And it's a movie that young, people should see to see that how hard it was to get uh, abortion Roe v. Wade, how hard. 
and all the things that women had to go through to get Me Too movement going. What did she do at those times? So I think there's so many, the, the humor is there, the love is there, but there's also a lot of points that I think young women, young people take for granted. So I'm, I'm hoping that this, I, I also very much like across the universe, I really like all ages to enjoy it at the same time. This isn't geared to one audience. And so uh, I'm not into that. I mean, it wasn't with Lion King. You can hate Broadway and you can still like it. You can <laughs> love Elton John or hate Elton John, but you might like the South African music. So, you know, I really think there's an expression that some friends of mine, the Brothers Quay said, these filmmakers, that making a work of art of any kind or a film, there's many, many floors. You get on the elevator, right? It could have 16 stories. It could have 20. You're allowed to get off on any floor. You know, that's what, when you do a Shakespeare play, you could be the groundlings and just like the body stuff, or you could be the philosophers and love what Shakespeare did. So I really believe that this movie is a very, it's not just for feminist quote, and that's a good word, but you understand, we really do hope a wide audience can see this. Mm. Me too. But Gloria, you have the yeah. last word. What do you want people to take away from this film? I, I, I agree with uh, the, the hope that different ages and different, you know, that all kinds of folks feel uh, attracted to, welcomed by uh, part of this amazingly huge, um, you know, living film that Julia <laughs> has created. And, and I would just, I would only add one more thing, which is that I hope it tells every individual human being to tell our own story. We all have a story. And in other times, we would be sitting in a circle, passing a talking stick around, <laughs> each person talking, everyone listening, each person being able to continuously tell our own stories. We've gotten into a kind of hierarchical culture, which is cut off people's stories and said, some people's stories are worth more than others. But I hope that this is a movie that leaves each individual unique viewer wanting to tell his or her own story and having faith that we want to listen to that story. Well, thank you both. Gloria, I think you'd be uh, happy to know that I'm seeing in the chat that people are having, uh, Smithies are having parties where they're, they're watching this interview together. Um, you are beloved by this community, as you know. And Julie, thank you so much for helping to tell Gloria's story and for being with us tonight. And to everyone watching in the Smith community, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you at the next presidential colloquium virtual, but we hope to see you. So stay safe and be well, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.